Hola, ¿cómo están todos y todas? Estamos en la Argentina Comic Con onceava edición y tenemos el gusto de estar con una de las personas más importantes del cómic internacional, David Mack. David Mack, how are you? Welcome to Argentina. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really enjoying it here. I appreciate it. It's your first time here? Yeah, my first time to Argentina. And what do you think about our country? I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I got to look around a little bit Thursday. I got in Thursday morning. Uh, I walked by the Casa Rosada, and uh, I'll be here for most of the week, so when the convention's over, I'll get to explore the city more. Okay, okay, perfect. Let's start, uh, let's take a time travel machine uh, to 94, and when you uh, do your first impression of uh, Kabuki. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let's take a time travel machine. Who? Yeah, yes. Exactly. Uh, who was that guy, and why he start uh, uh, and why he start to that epic story about Ukiko? Wow, what a question! Uh, so you even you even said Ukiko, so it sounds like you're familiar with the story. Of course, I'm fan. Oh uh, yeah, that that was a very young man uh, back then. Um, I was in college. I did the uh, book for my senior thesis in literature when I was in college. So it was being published while I was in school. And I, I was really young, but I was like a big fan of uh, autobiographical comics. But I was so young that I didn't feel unselfconscious enough to do like a complete autobiographical comic. And I felt like uh, if I made the main character of my story uh, a male, Um, I would maybe accidentally or subconsciously make it an idealized version of myself where people might look at it and think it was me. So I might be a little bit too self-conscious to be completely honest uh, with the story. So I thought, you know, I'll make the main character a different gender and I'll put it in a different part of the world with a different culture. And hopefully uh, I can use different metaphors to tell the story and then maybe the readers can look at it and, and maybe it'll be universal enough for them to see themselves in the character and story and I don't have to worry about them seeing me. So it gave me a little bit of a liberty and a flexibility to uh, be unselfconscious enough to work out like a lot of personal things but through the metaphors of, of that story. But, but did you know about the Japanese culture for example? Did, do you like a manga, anime, or, 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 or what, which was the um, conception of, of, of this project? So while I was in college, I was taking the Japanese language and uh, history and mythology. I had some really close friends uh, who were Japanese. So I was traveling, I was, I was learning a lot. So I, I had a lot of that uh, history and, and mythology and uh, uh, language and culture from Japan that I was kind of assimilating so I kind of thought that would be a good uh, colorful metaphor and some of the some of the archetypes from Japanese mythology I would use as the story and that could be kind of a structure that I could tell a personal story th through that. Let's move on, on future. You, you have two strong characters that you are known as is for example I, 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 I talk about Ukiko and Let's talk about Matt Murdock, uh, Daredevil. Do you think that it's a, a relationship between those uh, two both characters? Uh, I, I can see a certain relationship in that um, a lot of times when I'm writing a character who's an adult, I kind of think of a lot of what happened to this character as a child and formed how they are as an adult, right? So I usually look at, often it's a very traumatic incident that happens when they're younger or Uh, an episode when they're younger of something that happens that they're not in control of, um, you know, like like Matt Murdock, for instance. Uh, he, you know, saves the man from being hit by a car, but he gets blinded, you know, in the process. And I find that a lot of characters in comics, you know, like Batman, uh, has a interaction with crime as a as a young kid, and he's not in control of it. But what I what I realizes this, it happens with real people like this too, the same as with characters. Often real people have an experience at a certain time in their life that they're not in control of, and then they spend the rest, they spend a lot of the rest of their life as an adult trying to reenact that formative experience, but now in a way that they're controlling it. To so, fix it. Yeah, they're both reliving it, but trying to fix it at the same time. But in a way, it's kind of like a, a cycle that they get stuck in. 
you know, Batman has that experience with crime that he's not in control of, so he spends the rest of his adult life confronting criminals, but now in a way where he thinks he's more in control of it. And, you know, Daredevil in somewhat of a similar way. But, you know, Daredevil definitely has, like, a, a physical mark of that traumatic incident in the sense that it took away his eyesight. Uh, Kabuki uh, has a scar on her face uh, from that, you know, experience. Um, so, yeah, some of the characters have kind of like, a, you know, it's marked them physically, you know, and in, and in Kabuki's case, you know, it's changed the way that, you know, her, her face or how she appears. So she kind of interacts through the world, uh, with the world through, through a mask, you know. As Daredevil. Right, as Daredevil does, yeah. Okay, and you uh, work a lot with Brian Michael Bendis. Where do you know each other? Brian Michael Bendis and I met in Chicago in 1993 at a, uh, at a publisher's booth at a convention. We were both signing there. At the time, I was doing, um, this was before Kabuki had come out, I was, but I did have Kabuki published as a, uh, in a card set. Brian and I, there was a card set, it was called Comics Future Stars. It came out in 1993. Very indie, very, very indie. <laughs> And Brian had a piece in it too. He had a character in it that would later be a part of Powers. And I had, I had a Kabuki in this card set. And uh, we were talking about that and we were both signing uh, the, the, the indie books that we were working on at this indie publisher. And we got to know each other. And at the time I was just writing Kabuki, but I was looking for an artist to do it. And at the time Brian was writing and drawing his own comics, but he was looking for work as a penciler. He was trying to get uh, pencil jobs, and he had like some kind of job that he was penciling, and he showed me the stuff he was working on, and I talked to him about his inking, and he liked my advice about the inking of it, and he got me uh, hired as his inker. So we started working as a penciler inker team, and then Brian, we decided that Brian was going to be the, the artist for Kabuki. So originally, he was going to draw Kabuki. Oh, I didn't know that. Back in, back in 1993. Uh, so we, we worked on a few projects together, uh, and I kind of tricked myself into, into doing the art for Kabuki eventually. And he was writing and drawing his own crime comics. When I met him, he was doing a book called uh, Fire. And then after that, he did a book called uh, Goldfish, and then a book called Jinx, and then a crime comic called Torso. And when Kabuki came out, I showed it to Joe Casada in 1995 at a convention. And he called me and he, he liked the writing in it. And he said, sometime I'd like for us to work together where you know Joe does the art and I do the writing. And there were a couple ideas that didn't work out. And then eventually, maybe cut to 1997, I had Kabuki, I had started publishing it at Image Comics and I got a call from Joe Casada, and he said that he wanted to, uh, he was gonna be taking over some books at Marvel. And if I would start writing Daredevil after Kevin Smith was writing Daredevil, with Joe doing the artwork. And so that's how I got the job doing Daredevil from, you know, from the writing in Kabuki. And he also, we were doing the covers to get, you know, Joe was doing the art, but uh, I did the cover, I painted the cover of the first issue and the other ones, uh, I would send Joe layouts and Joe would pencil it and then Jimmy Palmiotti would ink it and then they would send it to me in a FedEx box. And so this is before the internet for us, this is before, <laughs> email before we were scanning things and sending covers digitally, uh, they would send me the, the pencil the inked cover based on my layout. I would take it out, the original, and I would paint directly on the original and try not to ruin it. And I would put it back in the Federal Express box and send it to New York, to the Marvel offices. It's, it's kind of another planet. <laughs> yeah, totally different experience, right? No cell phones. Uh, and, and so I took, uh, you know, Brian's crime comic called Torso, and I, I put these black and white comics inside the FedEx box with the cover. So Joe Casada opened, he called me, he said, hey, I got the cover, why are all these black and white indie comics in it? And I said, oh, that's my, you know, that's my best friend, Brian Bendis, is a book he writes and draw, you know, take a look, and he was like, oh, I don't really like his artwork. And I was like, well, well read it, I mean, maybe you, and he goes, oh, I do like his writing. Um, you know, maybe you guys want to work on a, on a project together. So we had, we had one project that we were gonna, we were gonna co-write with Bill Sienkiewicz doing the artwork. It didn't quite work out. And so instead, you know, I was, I was writing Daredevil, Joe was drawing it, but Joe in the process of drawing it had become editor in chief of Marvel. So he's getting much busier. And so he was, he was trying to, you know, he wasn't gonna be able to keep drawing Daredevil. 
So then I decided, I took a job drawing Daredevil just to get Brian a job as the writer for Daredevil after that. So that's how Brian got his Such a friend. job. <laughs> Such a good friend. And then, you know, and then much later, we got to work with Bill Sienkiewicz anyway. We, we co-wrote Daredevil End of Days with Bill Sienkiewicz and Klaus Janssen doing the art on it, who are both guys that we grew up reading their, their work when we were kids. And now, we got, now they, we got to write a story with them drawing. It's a huge thing. And you told me about uh, the digital art versus the analogic art. Uh, you have a very unique painting uh, aesthetic. What do you feel about the digital art? You still working on a um, canvas, a physical canvas, and then you work on digital, or you work on digital um, at the first step of all the process? Uh, I do it all by hand. Yeah, so I don't really know much about digital stuff. You know, my, my experience with the digital is once it's all finished, I scan it in on a scanner now, and I don't send it in FedEx anymore. Okay. I scan it, you know, I might put some, some text on it, or, uh, you know, I might, like, I might scan two different layers and put them on top of each other. Uh, but aside from that, uh, I do it all by hand. You know, I just attach it in the email and send it that way. It's, it's more romantic. It's more romantic. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> okay, and the last question. You know, I should also say, also you have an original piece of art that, you know, you can then either keep or give or sell. Uh, so, you know, it's nice, it's nice having that original art also. Yes, yes, of course. And the last question. If you can pick one character, which character do you like to pick in order to write and draw in? You know, a long time ago, I was offered to write Batman, uh, but I was, I was so busy with Marvel doing other things, and I guess at the time I felt some kind of loyalty to Marvel, uh, you know, because they invited me to work with them. Um, you, you need to talk with, with Bendis right now, because I think, I think that could be. Yeah, yeah, it would, it would be fun to work on a Batman project eventually, you know. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you for your time.